Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending our webinar on making the best decision, migrate or upgrade SharePoint 2010 workflows. Microsoft kind of threw this uh, ball in our lap or whatever you want to call it. So this uh, with this ending of the 2010 workflows uh, starting in November, which is only a few months away. So people are scrambling to figure out a solution and we want to offer this webinar. I am Scott Restivo the, with Crow Canyon Software. Joel Olison of Proficient and also a Microsoft MVP will be giving the initial presentation along with Ron Jones, Director of Modern Solutions at uh, Proficient. So uh, Ron and Joel will be giving the first part of the presentation and I think you'll find a lot of good information there. And I'll be giving a part at the end talking about what Crow Canyon Software is doing in this world of SharePoint 2010 workflow replacement. So I think it'll be a very valuable webinar. Uh, thank you again for attending. Now, a few, a couple things before we get going, then we'll jump right into it. And that is that we're going to be putting up a couple polls, and hopefully you can participate in those and get, you know, help us uh, understand the environment out there a little better. And then also, um, there's a question in your in your webinar screen. There's a question area, and you can put in any question you want in there. We'll try and answer during the webinar, but uh, likely in these webinars we get a lot of questions we aren't able to answer all of them we'll try to do what we can we'll have a q a at the end and uh, then we'll follow up with uh email or a blog or something that answers any outlying questions that we aren't able to answer during the webinar i'm sure it'll, it'll generate a lot of interest a lot of questions and a lot of people are kind of stuck in this situation where the 2010 workflows that run on office 365 are being phased out uh, kind of abruptly in some sense and uh hopefully we'll give you help give you some guidance of what Proficient, or Ron and Joel Proficient, and Crow Canyon here, it's me at Crow Canyon, what we can do here to help you out and uh, give you some way forward. So, Joel, you want to take it from here? Sure, sure. Okay, go ahead. So, the first thing we want to do is we want to kind of help you understand what Microsoft announced um, just recently. But uh, this, this this whole agenda is really to help you understand, wrap your head around what's going on with the, short, the SharePoint workflows, what's that timeline. And I've got a couple different slides, one that starts from a very simplistic perspective and another one that dives much deeper into it to help you, um, once you understand what the announcement is, kind of dive in a little bit deeper. Um, I want to talk about this. COE starter kit, and you're going to say, what in the world? Why are we talking about that? Uh, I'll give you some context to what the COE is and kind of the proficient approach to the power platform. So it's not just about how do we stuff the 2010 workflows into the cloud or to up upgrade what's in the cloud. It's really about what should, you know, if you're going to do this right, how would we do it? If you're going to do it scrappy, how would you do it? I want to kind of help you understand the different approaches, help you understand what that timeline is, and then also really help you understand if you're going to do it yourself, you know, here's some of the analysis you should do. If you need help, we're definitely here to help and uh, want you to help help you understand what that approach might look like as well. And uh, we're going to hand it back over to Scott to, to basically dig a little bit into some other considerations around the Power Platform and introduce you to um, one of the great products in the uh, Microsoft ecosystem called Nitro Studio. And they've got some other um, kind of cool things they've built. So let's dive into this making the best decisions kind of SharePoint 2010 workflows um, side of it. Uh, but before we do, uh, we Ron and I both work for, for Proficient. It's a publicly traded on the NASDAQ company. We've actually uh, have been in business since 97. We've, uh, you know, half billion in revenue. Uh, the, and the reason I want to tell you this is we, we actually are large. We have the ability to support your needs. We work with Fortune 500s, a um, lot of repeat business. So um, just want to help you understand it from that perspective. Um, and uh, when you start talking about, you know, our partnership with Microsoft, we're definitely strategic partner with Microsoft. We work around a number of things, but absolutely our, our modern productivity business is, is big. Uh, in fact, Ron is our director in, in modern productivity. You want, why don't you introduce yourself, Ron? Sure thing, Joel. Um, can you hear me okay? 
Yeah, I can hear you fine. Great. So, yeah, Ron Jones from uh, Proficient. My role has kind of moved up from modern productivity to owning all of modern workplace, which of course is all your Microsoft 365 stuff. But as Joel indicated, for from an overall Proficient perspective, we've had deep seeds in the Microsoft ecosystem since BPAWS and even before that. We were one of the, one of the you know earlier adopters and migrators of people to exchange back when we were trying to figure out whether you know SharePoint was still going to be a thing back in the day. So um, pleasure to be on this call naturally. And yeah, as far as proficient goes, we we're one of the leading partners, one of the top ten teams partners. And of course, we just have a lot of strategic relationships and partnerships across this ecosystem. You know, whether it's CoreView, Tigraph. Um, Nintex and others, and of course, a working relationship with the folks over at Nitro. So happy to be here today. Yeah, and you know, just I, I don't know, we're not going to be talking much about Nintex, but um, um, one one quick thing on Nintex, I did give them a call, and uh, they did say, uh, if you're running Nintex, no impact. So I don't spend, plan to spend much time talking about that on this particular call. Um, That's right. But uh, that's good news. I think a lot of people who may be worried, hey, am I in a worse situation because I'm using a third-party tool? Um, actually, you're probably in a better situation. So um, whether you're using Crow Canyon or Nintex, the, you, you very likely are in a better situation because these legacy workflows, um, especially when you're in the cloud, they're, they're basically hold, holding you back. And that's part of what we want to help you understand. And uh, so let's get right into those announcements. Basically, August 1st, SharePoint 2010 workflows, you will not be able to create new ones. They're going to block the ability to create new 2010 workflows and new tenants. So, you know, you may, I don't want, I don't want that to be confusing at all. But basically, if you're wondering, are 2010 workflows dead? This is basically how they get buried, how they, they go <laughs> <Sorry>. away. <laughs> so yeah, another thing to really be concerned about is that you know when it came to 2013, a lot of us were still using 2010 workflows. When we migrated to SharePoint Online, we were still using that engine. So yeah. I mean, it's really, really important that we have a good state of the union on some of this stuff because it's affecting everyone in the community and of course, you know, just this entire ecosystem, as I said earlier. And if, if any of this spurs questions you may have, feel free to put those questions in the Q&A. We're gonna save 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. And I'm hoping that along the way, we'll be able to answer some questions. But if you have any questions related to the what, what this is about or, you know, what, what this is kind of saying, Ultimately, the, the thing to understand here is this is kind of a process that's happening. It's like the first thing they do is they block it on new tenants, then they turn it off for all existing tenants, and then the third thing they do do is they um, they're actually removing it from from tenants. And you're going to see that um, in in the the drill down where I, I actually provide more information. These this is more about getting it turned off, but essentially if you're talking about well, what is my, when does Microsoft actually remove my workflows? And uh, you'll, you'll see that in the next set of uh, uh, drill just one, Joe, just one quick question on the February 1st one. It says the same as the November 1st one. Is that, how's the difference between, the, someone's asking between 2010, turn off all tenants on November 1st and February 1st? Is that? And I think, that it, I think what we're seeing there, and it is kind of a, in fact, I'm gonna edit this slide just to reduce the confusion. This is actually the removal. The what? Removed. Right. One, the first oh, one's turning removed. it off. The next one's okay. removing them. I like how you revise it in real time. But yeah. That, yeah, you that like that? Yeah. yeah. Good. Good. Let's, right. let's reduce the confusion instead of just talking to it. Just in case anybody took a screenshot before, take a new screenshot. <laughs> yep. And and if you notice, it's a lot like what they did with um, Skype Online as well and tenants, where they started to take it away for certain size tenants, and then you know stop provisioning the entire workload for in favor of Teams. So it shouldn't be too foreign. At the same time, I think this affects a lot of us. To your point, Joel. 
Yeah, and, and in fact, um, if you're wondering about these dates and what are the hard dates versus soft dates and if you call support and all that kind of thing, that February 1st date, even though it seems like everybody's kind of focused on August and November, February 1st is actually the one that um, is really the one you should burn into your brain because February 1st, if you get exceptions, that is the date. That is the date that basically, if you get an exception and say, hey, it's it's less about creating new ones and it's more about, hey, how do I keep my stuff working? The date you need to be worried about is February 1st because that's where you can get an exception through support. But that February 1st date is when they're, they really want to start removing it from all tenants. Um, so if, if you're, say, say you've got seriously business critical ones, you know, we, we would be happy to help help you make that business case with Microsoft to be able to get an extension. And I would absolutely expect that extension to land somewhere around January or February of 2021. So there there is the ability to get an extension. Um, but, but, you know, since we're looking at the dates, that February 1st is the one where Microsoft really wants to start doing serious cleanup. Joe, one quick point you might want to make is that this has no effect on on-premises. And people are asking that question over, several people are asking that. Oh yeah, I'm glad you clarified that. We This is absolutely about SharePoint Online. If you're running on-prem, um, you, you could say that, uh, you know, these things have been deprecated, it's no longer on the roadmap, but as it relates to 2016 and 2019, on-prem SharePoint, um, you do have until 2026 um, from a support perspective. And I'm not talking about SharePoint Server 2010, I'm talking about if you're running SharePoint Server 2016 or 2019, you can be running these legacy workflows um, from a supportability perspective. Since it's in your platform on-prem, you have longer. So you're, the, the dates are, are different. It's more, it, it basically falls in line with the end of life of those platforms. And if that's not clear, feel free to follow or ask a follow-up question. And anything more you wanted to add on this, Ron? No, I, th I think we've properly drained that one at the same time. I'm sure there'll be some room for clarity as needed, considering, you know, we've, we've, we've seen these four dates pretty regularly, but, you know, the devil's in the details to your point. Yeah. One person was asking about being able to modify workflows if they're turned off or blocked. So one of the interesting things is on that after that November 1st, that's really when they begin. So they're going to begin turning it off. So it may be November 14th when they do it for your tenant, as an example. And if you're trying to modify things, um, it's the ability to create new. So the first thing is blocking new, and mm -hmm. then it's turning it off. And uh, it's the removal that is is the serious part. So, like, if you if you're trying to change things in the near term, you're probably fine. It's the it's the it's basically APIs is what they're doing first. Um, it's the APIs. So basically, your ability to use SharePoint Designer to go in and start modifying your workflows. That's what you're going to notice is it blocks SharePoint Designer, uh, and they're looking at the APIs that are going in there to modify those. Um, they have as well mentioned that uh, your ability to download your workflows um, that you do you, you will have some of that some of that ability in November to be able to they'll, they'll be there you can download them uh, hopefully that helps you as you're trying to work on your um, your migrations or whatever but uh, but essentially if you think oh we'll we'll get to it eventually as long as they leave them there well that's it's it's the cleanup happens in February. All right, um, yeah, so we'll come back to that uh, in more detail a little bit later. Um, we talked about the extensions. I didn't want to forget, um, but basically, if you've got a situation, you feel like your house is on fire, um, absolutely give Microsoft a ring. The, they did actually, in the announcements, encourage people that if they need an extension, that they should contact support. Um, if you want us to help facilitate that, we're we're absolutely help, help, happy to help facilitate as well. 
That's right. And I mean, a lot of people, you know, these are new projects for some, right? And they aren't budgeted. They're, this announcement may be coming out of nowhere. And we want to make sure that we're advocates for everyone that we can be advocates for just because of how um, big of a deal this is for us and how effective it is. Yeah. So I got one little analogy for you. Um, and obviously, I don't necessarily have rights to show the movie. This is a 30 second clip from YouTube. <laughs> um, hopefully this will uh, drill in the point a little bit. So hopefully this will this will run too. <laughs> All right, Ho hopefully that uh, drove home the point may have distracted you a little bit. Um, but as we're talking about workflow, um, I want to <laughs> I want you to remember as you're working on this, it's old and busted, a new hotness. Old and busted, we're thinking InfoPath, right? That's that's some tech, you know, you think about SharePoint Designer, some seriously old tech. Um, old and busted, and then we got the new hotness. Now I think a lot of companies have been struggling with how to embrace the Power Platform. Let me tell you, it has arrived. It is the new hotness. I know that it's not 100% parallel, but there is a way and uh, we want to help you get there, all right? Um, Power Apps, um, <laughs> Power BI, I know that was written in there wrong. Power Automate, Power Virtual Agents, talking the uh, third-party enhancements. You know, there's there's a lot of really cool stuff going on in the cloud. Where, where you've got hundreds of connections, uh, the, 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 the cool chatbot kind of stuff, the um, mobile experience. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of really cool stuff. In fact, uh, at Perficient, we ran a, a hackathon recently. Super cool, the, 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 the dynamic, uh, what do they call those? The, the, the dynamic cards. Anyway, there's some really cool stuff we were working on. Yeah, the adaptive cards. The adaptive cards, absolutely. Yeah, and I think just doubling down on that point, yeah, we're going to go to, through the process in a second, but, you know, some things are going to be a one-to-one, -one, right? Some, you'll take an InfoPath form or a SharePoint Designer workflow and build another form and build a flow for it, and that's great. But let's not lock ourselves into that dogma, right? Let's start talking about transformation where it's appropriate and also enabling people, which is where that COE toolkit comes to play. But let's get into it a little bit, Joel. Yeah, yeah, and the other thing I was I, I would say is like if you're trying to map features, you know, yeah, there's not 100% mapping, but we do have third-party solutions that can actually help in uh, in certain cases where it's a it's a serious requirement, you know, it's something <clears throat> business uh, critical. <clears throat> excuse me, where um, you know, let's let's analyze it and determine if it uh, makes sense. So let's talk about uh, one of the things you'll hear from Microsoft is this concept of COE, the center of excellence. And inside of an organization, when you start talking about um, this maker movement, this idea of DIY, you know, being able to do it yourself, distributed, kind of cheap, democratized tool. And I said should say inexp inexpensive instead of the word cheap. Cheap kind of over <laughs> overdoes it. Inexpensive, clever. Uh, democratized, distributed, the idea of really being able to empower these makers, people who are actually, their job is not in IT, their job is to do things in the business, but when they understand that they can actually use this technology to, to build cool stuff and to make things easier, you know, back in the day, this was somebody building something with SharePoint Designer, you know, being able to fix up a page or add links or, um, you know, build a workflow. Now we've actually got, uh, you know, the Power BI, the Power Apps, the Power Automate, all these cool technologies that are really designed for people in the business. And it's not, it's, this isn't just a new kind of developer. These these are people that are in the business that when they use these tools, they can build all sorts of really cool stuff. So this is actually a culture. It's a movement. Uh, when you talk about you know the future of work, 
It's about allowing people to be empowered. This is all about empowerment. Exactly right. When, when, when you look in your business and you're looking at those folks that used to take Excel spreadsheets and make them do backflips and do a bunch of really cool stuff, those are the folks that we're talking about, right? The people who know their business processes, who, you know, the Power Platform was intended for, let's say, who could just take the data set, put forms on top of it, and build a worthwhile solution or application. Like those are the, the kinds of people. But then as this concept starts to branch out, it's really just about people knowing their data so that they can be that steward of the application and transforming what it is today into what it should be in the future. Yeah, I, I love the story about yeah. how you land at Heathrow Airport. It's a power app now that actually every airplane that goes in and out of there is part of a power app. Uh, and it wasn't written by IT. This wasn't an IT driven project. This was actually somebody whose job it was. I, I don't know all the details, but <laughs> wow, every plane that goes in there and out of there is basically tracked with some kind of power app. Um, kind of blows my mind. Um, but you hear these stories about people who built stuff. I also love the, uh, and you may have seen the one that was Inspire last year, where they're using object detection where the guy, it was his job to count bottles, you know, inventory management. Now he takes a photo and uh, how much cooler is his job where he, before he used to have to count and see how many bottles were sitting there. Now he just takes a few photos with his phone and uh, it's more efficient, it's quicker, and now he can actually focus on what he enjoys doing. So that's, that's it's really cool to hear those stories. And uh, now let's take this back to what we're talking about here from a perspective of migrating over your workflows. And when you say, hey, we've got all these 2010 workflows worried about what to do, if you want to understand how to do it right, when you talk about the center of excellence, one of the most important things I believe from a foundational perspective is environments. And so when you're talking about power apps, flows, hey, if we can actually organize these into environments and whether it's dev, test, staging, production, or whether it's, hey, we have a pre-production for this department where they can actually build out their solutions and understand this is not just all about IT, it's about empowering the business. And so they've got their different data sources, they've got things that they're working on, they want to allow things to happen, but how do you get your arms around that if you are IT? How do you empower that? How do you essentially get your arms around it? It's, it's absolutely COE. It is center of excellence and this starter kit can help you get a start on that. Um, but abs absolutely this idea of empowerment and uh, being able to manage it, not just from an IT perspective, but empowering the business. Uh, and what you also get, some of you who may have played with power apps or flow and been worried about governance, you know, how do you manage this stuff? Well, how about the fact that uh, when you're using the center of excellence and some of these, these toolkits, you, you can actually ensure what compliance is. You can say, these are connectors we've authorized. So the person who's building an app says, hey, this connector is unauthorized, or hey, you've got a compliance um, consideration, your app needs to stay in compliance or, hey, the owner of this app just left, it's been flagged for archiving, or, or it needs to be assigned a new owner. So these kinds of things are absolutely possible. And uh, when you're saying, hey, we wanna do this right, this, these are the kinds of things that uh, being able to get the right kind of COE in place um, and, and understanding this is not a full presentation on just center of excellence, but I just captured a couple of different slides just to help you understand what's possible. That's and, right, because uh, it's not a one size fit all to your point, right, Joel? I mean, this is one of those things where, you know, you're gonna get to the point of where you need to do this level of enforcement, and then there are gonna be other aspects of your COE within your organization that just help route your users to the right solution, which is, you know, just a, a major part of being a good steward for governance and, you know, evangelizing a platform within the organization. Yeah, and, and I think that one of the freakiest things was this idea that, what do you mean anybody can build an app? What do you mean? <laughs> yeah. You know, like, well, what happens if they add this connector or that connector? What happens if it, 
is long running and uh, what happens if it's connected to, to Azure? Like these things are right. so scary for people and uh, it doesn't have to be scary uh, if, if you basically put in some of the right tools to be able to, to, to manage and monitor that. I, I love this visual here. Yeah. Um, it helps you understand. You wanna understand what your power apps are? You wanna know who's making them? You wanna know what flows and connectors are in use? Who are your top makers? Where do they live? What connections are they using? This is fantastic from a visibility and transparency perspective where you can then build a community around it. And uh, you know, imagine the first time you run um, this, this starter kit where you start gathering this data and what it can potentially empower in terms of your ability to mentor these people to ensure that they're in compliance and uh, to help them be more productive. This is how you scale. You know, it's like, hey, we don't have enough people. Guess what? You've got people. Those people are in the business. It's your it's your job to recruit them as makers and to empower them. Now you've got champion programs on uh, you know, people in the business and empowering them to be successful. That's right. And then you can just work about compliance, enforcement, and enabling people versus having to be there for every little step of the way and becoming inundated with small requests and some of those other things that get in the way of pushing you forward. So, and when you talk about, well, what, what can Proficient do to help us as we move our 2010 or 2013 workflows into the Power Platform? You know, you may have been very hesitant to really adopt the Power Platform. And what I'm saying today is, Power Platform is ready for you. And there's actually a really cool set of things that uh, we can do to help you to create an environment that's that's conducive to this maker movement inside your organization. And if you're worried about compliance or you're worried about governance, this is where the COE comes in to be able to help you get your arms around it and to manage it in such a way that it can be very empowering. That's right. And the unfortunate part to this is that this is happening with or without you. So you need to make sure that you're on the front end of this and enabling your users and providing them a clear path versus them, you know, um, spinning up, whether it is Smartsheet or, you know, applications in Slack or something else that may not be managed within your organization. You also want to head that off at the past too, to make sure that, you know, you can become a champion for people, but also have a good handle on what your users are doing. I mean, it's very, you know, both sides of the coin kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, th I think that these these are great for being able to get the transparency, the visibility, be able to build relationships. And this is really just scratching the surface on what's possible. It shows you that it is possible and uh, gives you um, the ability to kind of understand Who's making a virtual agent? What connectors are they using? Oh, those are premium connectors. Let's block those premium connectors until we actually validate the business scenarios. Let's have people come to us and say what they're trying to build. Let's let's turn this into a process that's supportive. Exactly. It's not just about blocking. It's actually, no, no, no. There's a right way to be able to get the connectors you want. And let's make sure that we have a front door and a process of, of how to provision, how to you know b create a conducive environment to be able to support the business for what they need to get done. And it's not wild and crazy and gets out of control. Completely. All right, a um, couple more things on this. So we I introduced those dates at the beginning, a little bit more detail here. Um, You'll, you'll notice that uh, SharePoint Designer there at the bottom, as well as those references. You'll see those references on the last slide as well. Basically, Microsoft's, you know, she's pointing out those references at the bottom first. Microsoft made the announcement. That's, that's the Microsoft short link there of the workflow update. There's some support um, detail around uh, supportability of the workflows, which goes into more detail around from a support perspective. And then there's the migration guidance, which goes into some of the things I'll be talking about in a minute in relation to, yes, it's true, there are some things that are different between 2010 workflows and between Power Automate as an example. 
Um, but so let me just see if there's anything else in here that we didn't mention earlier. Um, yeah, so basically the way to understand the difference between 2010 and 2013 is Microsoft's really starting with the 2010 workflows and trying to end those first. So basically it's block them from being created and then basically turning turning off the ability to, to, to create them, to um, kind of deprecate it and then clean it up. With the 2013, it's blocking on new tenants then existing tenants. And then uh, you'll, those will kind of hang out for a lot longer um, with the idea that sometime in 2026 that they'll clean those up as well. Um, and on on prem um, is the big one where it's like on prem basically you've got till July 2026 or so, and you can refer to the that support um, article in relation to the end of life, and it basically is product end of life for 26 and 2019. Um, some people may be wondering about InfoPath. <laughs> um, if you're still dealing with the InfoPath forms, um, you know, this is an opportunity to clean up that as well, uh, especially with in relation to the workflows behind those InfoPath forms. Um, you know, basically we're talking about Power Apps and Power Automate. Those two kind of go hand in hand. This legacy cleanup absolutely is a great opportunity that when you're running the uh, modernization toolkit, which we're going to talk about in a second, that as you're looking at that, think about not just the workflows. Those workflows are often hooked into forms um, that are that are built by InfoPath. So if you're going to be touching these things, it's not about, hey, let's rebuild this in InfoPath and use a uh, Power App. <laughs> you may want to actually look at the application holistically and understand, hey, let's build this in the new hotness, right? Yeah, <laughs> now you got it. Exactly. No, I mean, think about it. And, and like, I know the Fab 40 has a bad rap and we and I totally get that, but that model still exists today because we're building solutions out of a lot of different Lego pieces. So you have to make sure that you have a good picture of what the current set of Legos are before you start moving them into the new hotness and the new awesome Legos. Because otherwise you're gonna leave something, you're gonna leave an associated list or a site definition or something to that effect, unfortunately, which I get some of that stuff is blocked already. But the bottom line is you have to understand all of the inner working pieces so that you can transform it into something better. Yeah, absolutely. So there is, there are a couple of things that you could probably call out like that are listed here. Um, the 2013 workflows are gonna be turned off in new tenants. There is a PowerShell script that you can use. These are workarounds, um, not something that we would recommend. Um, yeah, if you're building a new tenant, I really hope, I think it's a little bit sad that you'd uh, have to turn on your 2013 workflows. <laughs> Yeah, we're just talking about technical debt at this point, right? I mean, that's what it comes down to is we're just kind of pushing this stuff along, unfortunately, but we got to get out of that. Absolutely. So let's talk about the solution a little bit. And and I do to see the solution as being, all right, how do we get this taken care of? How do we go from point A to point B? So when we talk about this, um, first off, there is this modernization scanner. Uh, we're talking about the PNP, the Patterns and Practices group have built a modernization scanner. So on the left-hand screenshot, and yes, thanks Todd Clint for his uh, his work. He's done some great blogs on this topic. Those who are doing Absolutely. kind of the DIY model, uh, the do-it-yourself, you're going to find some great tips and tricks there from Todd. Um, but basically, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to connect into it, into our tenant. So you can do the Azure AD app. You're gonna then authorize and it can do its scanning. You're gonna, you know, if, if you need certificates and uh, to be able to connect in, especially if you're using uh, MFA, but basically connect in, run the scanner. And the, what you're gonna do is there's, a, there's one specific dropdown in that list called classic workflows. Uh, you can also see the info path is the one right below it. So you can basically run those two reports to get an idea of where are all the info path forms, where are all these classic workflows. And so the, that, that kind of the first step is to download and, and to run it. It's actually a self running executable. Um, then it's gonna find 
all of the 2010 and 2013 workflows, and it's actually going to put them in two buckets. So you can actually see on the next screen an example of how the, how it does that. Um, but uh, part of this tool is to give it an upgradability score. So it's looking for certain things, and uh, and ultimately what you're going to do is kind of look at the usage, the history. Let's let's essentially put these into buckets, whether it's uh, red, yellow, green, or whether it's like, hey, this is the bucket of things that uh, we can do that are easy, low hanging fruit. Hey, we just let's. There's a certain number of processes that uh, you know off the shelf type workflows versus ones that are going to be a little bit more complex. And uh, so when you think about that, there's kind of this go, no go. Obviously, if it's a very low score and it's a um, not being used, hey, let's ignore those. Why, why even touch the ones uh, that are like that? Um, so there's a bit of um, go, no go, ignore, um, put them in these different buckets. And I've got some buckets in, in the upcoming, but essentially it leads to this process of, okay, we've, we've got our candidate workflows to then go and build. And so whether you decide to do DIY or if you wanna bring in a partner, it's up to you. Um, but uh, essentially you, sh you should ultimately come up with some, some criteria for that. Um, now, before we move on, I'm just gonna put, launch a quick poll to understand who we've got on the line in relation to this. So the poll should now be open. And uh, you should be starting to see that. Uh, it may take a minute, but uh, like as an example, there may be some people who are just trying to understand what this is all about that are on the call. There may be others who have already dug into the modernization scanner and been working with the results and been trying to decide what are all our, what are all the decisions what are what 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 should we be doing here um, there may be others who are saying hey we could actually use some help we're really worried about this timeline um, understanding it may be an exception for you um, you may be somebody who frequently uses help or maybe you typically do things on your own but uh, you're worried about your bandwidth um, and then there's others who are like, hey, they, they just came to the webinar and are trying to understand what, what the options are, what the possibilities are, and just to get more educated about what Microsoft kind of just launched on everybody. Um, so I, I totally get that. Uh, and I appreciate those, those who voted. I'm going to now um, share that just um, real brief. Happy to share the results with everybody here. And you can see... Most people are planning on running the modernization themselves, but there are a number on here as well who are concerned about the timeline. Totally not surprised. Like when you when you look at Microsoft's blog post, you can see that there's a lot of people who are actually quite upset about the timeline and they just want more time. I, I get it. Um, not sure if you have any more to say about that, Ron, before we move on, but. Uh, no, I, I think the, the the frustrations just abound, right? I mean, I'm imagining like I helped to run the Atlanta SharePoint user group, well, SharePoint Office 365 user group in Atlanta, and it came up yesterday, and we had some other MVPs on, and I mean, it's it's all over the place, and we're just trying to make sure we have the right, the accurate information for everyone, right? And yeah. everyone has like a good template just to move on from, and can easily go through that rot exercise, you know, like. What needs to die on a vine? What's redundant? What's obsolete? What's trivial? And what's really meaningful so that we can make some good decisions and in some cases go for funding, but at the very least, just know how big of a cow we have to eat from a technical debt perspective and moving on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I need to kind of wrap things up a little bit. Um, basically, what you should be looking at now, you run that modernization scanner, it gives you a workflow report. It's gonna give you some level of information around um, an upgradability score. There may be some th additional details you might need to gather, and I would encourage you to understand complexity. You know, you need as a business, just because it's been running doesn't necessarily mean it's priority or understanding the severity of the business if, if, if Microsoft went in and just removed it. 
So understanding the usage, the complexity, the priority, the severity, those are kind of three or four areas that I kind of feel like are absolutely things that need to be gathered before you can start to make decisions. And even with that, there's some other data that needs to be gathered. Who owns these? Is there budget there? Um, if there is budget, is it a hire or is it uh, IT? How are we gonna line up people to get this done? And is this a November date or are we gonna get an exception? Are we gonna work with Microsoft to just make sure that they give us a little bit more time to meet that February date? Um, and ultimately I kind of see there's three major buckets, the power platform, which is where Microsoft would love for you to land, the third party tools, which is part of the ecosystem and Microsoft as well, absolutely based on your requirements would be recommending. And then there's the do nothing. If you do nothing, Microsoft's going to clean it up. It's going to be nice and easy for you. <laughs> if you just do, just continue to just continue to use the environment as is, do nothing. It won't cost you anything other than the chaos that ensues once all your workflows are gone. <laughs> that's right. We'll say easy for some, difficult for others, right? Yeah, that's right. So um, let me kind of wrap this up. I think that was what you're uh, going to get. Is Joel, the Joel. Um, there was a mention about user voice and Johnny, our buddy Johnny, Johnny yeah, Lopez there. Yeah. No, absolutely. I love that user voice where basically they, they created a user voice that says, hey, give us more time. And uh, I know that he, last time I was looking, there were a few hundred uh, responses to that. I don't know if you've looked at that recently. Yeah, that and just the comments on those announcement articles are very interesting, but a lot of what you expect. So yeah, stay on that user voice, vote it as much as you can, and evangelize to your friends because we're all affected. Yeah, but ultimately, ultimately the bottom line is that you do have to move off these. I mean, maybe not in that shorter time frame, but you're missing out on new technologies, you're missing out on new opportunities with a by perpetuating the you know 2010 workflows, which are a good five, 10 years old, if not long, you know, I mean, they're, they're oh, yeah. old. No, like there's the no old, reason for doing nothing. Busted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no one wants to stay old and busted, right? At the same time, you know, you, you gotta maximize all the efforts you have in front of you before you just go screaming for help as well. We totally get that part of it. I think you're right, Scott. Yeah. yeah. Let me, well, let me, let me introduce you to this, Scott. Um, I, I think that there's the, ignore do nothing which is very easy for it to do but man to the business just think about all the impact that that's going to be um of the unknown it'd be much better to be in a place where you know what that's what impact that's going to be and so that takes some homework to be able to get there um but as well like if you're in, if you're investing in the power platform good for you you know that's that's obviously the new hotness but this microsoft ecosystem hey we're in a neighborhood you know, there's a lot of different kinds of connectors. There's a lot of things going on. And I, I listed a few of those things here, like cyclical workflows, the long running workflows, those premium connectors, some in-person impersonation and like permissions. There's a lot of scenarios where you, you absolutely should be looking at looping in a third party. Um, and I know this is an area that you were thinking about uh, providing a bit more insight into, Scott. If you want to share your screen or if you want to just talk to it here. Um, did we lose Scott? No, I just had it on mute. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I've been answering these questions. And so uh, let me see. So you want me to jump in right here and talk? Uh, you yeah, yeah. In fact, I, I could sit on this slide for you. <laughs> yeah, I have that in a, uh, in my slide deck. Okay. So. Yeah. Um, up here. I was just asking, asking, answering a question about features that are hard to migrate, and and the answer I was given was Power Automate does not cover all the features you might need, you know, in uh, your workflows. So let's get into that a little bit. Uh, that you know, we promote the Power Platform, we're being a part of Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera, but there are limitations to it and what it can do. And uh, we have done a number of Crow Canyon, that is, has done a webinar, and we have PDFs on. You know, the complex environment of the power platform, licensing it, how do you know if you need a standalone versus the paid for, you know, I mean, there's, there's a power automate, power apps, they come what they call seated inside of Office 365, which means they're included in your Office 365 subscription. 
But as Microsoft states uh, in, uh, oh, I can show my screen, in a number of their literature, they say that they, uh, to get the full features of those platforms, you need to go to their standalone plans, and their standalone plans cost uh, pretty substantial amounts of money when you finally get into the the down and dirty of it, you know, the details of it. And I could launch into a whole, I did a whole webinar in February, I think it was, on the limitations and costs of Power Platform. And it was quite interesting. Let me do, I will share my screen here in a second. And uh, then you look, the thing is, it's very detailed when you get into the cost structure for Power Apps and Power Automate. There are so many like this and that, you know, could be, could be, you know, that, go on that you that one of the comments we get quite often is that we don't know our cost is going to be when we use the power apps and the power automate and also Microsoft makes changes such as uh, in last October they moved a bunch of standard connectors to the premium so including SQL server connector so all of a sudden people who were looking at oh I'm, I get it with my seated you know included inside of office 365 and now to get the features I need to really run sufficient workflows I have to go over to uh, the premium connectors you know pay the price and that's uh, you know ten dollars per user per month or forty dollars user per month for power apps and then uh, I think it's 15 per per user and Power Automate and 500 for five flow. I mean, there's these numbers start to add up significantly and people do the math and figure that this is going to be a lot more expensive than I thought. And not only that, as Joel was saying there, uh, showing there in his slide, there are a number of considerations that go on on the, uh, on the um, uh, you know, what Power Automate does and does not have there. So let me get, I'll show the screen and we can go from there with this, okay? So let me get this out of the way. And so those considerations are kind of complex. I mean, Joel was going over them in quite detail. I mean, the slides in, in detail there. Uh, so here's a, okay, so here we go. I'll switch the screens, swap the presenter. Yeah, here's Crow Canyon. We've been around for 20 years. We're doing business applications, you know, since 1999, believe it or not. And we have uh, applications, Nitro Studio, which I'll talk about. We can go into a little bit in that. We don't have too much time custom solutions now we're doing also bots and AI services we're a preferred partner and uh, certified small business in California so we did a whole uh, show on this we have a PDF we have a lot of information and I'm not going to go into it right now because it is an extensive amount of the detail on um, and you can see the webinar you can look at we can send you our PDF on it there's just a caution about uh, getting too beholden to that as the only uh, the one and only solution uh, Power Automate. So if you stay within the limited set of features that are included with the seated version, okay, the costs are whatever you pay for your subscription. But if you need more comprehensive features, premium connectors, model-driven apps, use the common data service, Power Apps portals, Power BI Pro or Premium, Power Virtual Agents, Power Automate with robotics process automation, all of a sudden you have to go into the premium pricing. And here at Microsoft even said in February, this, this is when I was just, uh, they put out this licensing guide, this is Microsoft saying this in their in their licensing guide. Customers that need general purpose and full capabilities should license Power Apps on a standalone basis. Same for Power Automate, license it on a standalone basis. Well, what is that standalone basis? Well, here we go. To use the premium or the advanced features, premium features of Power Apps, you have to go to ten dollars user per month or the forty dollars per user per month. Well, forty dollars per user per month adds up quickly. If they got a hundred users, four thousand, that's forty eight thousand a year. I mean, you do the math, it starts to really uh, add up even for small organizations with 100 users and then you got to add on the power automate capability now i know i'm skimming over this and there's a lot of detail in fact that's one of the things that make power platform a little difficult for people to get their heads around because there is a lot a lot of licensing minutia in there you know uh that goes on so some power apps will include some capabilities of power automate but not all the capabilities of power automate but power automate has this and they have to get standalone for that and it's like what and uh fortunately I spent a lot of time figuring this all out uh, and do have a lot of information so you can contact me and you know proficient I'm sure has it too and we could help you you know to, you know assess the true cost of this um, of this platform so it's not not for oh this is oh I want to go back to that slide because this is something Joel and eh, come back here I'm going the wrong way back the other way there we go Joel and uh, Joel and, and Crow Can we did a webinar last August August almost a year ago about all the uh, features that are not in Power Apps. So there are there not only uh, you pay for the premium connectors and all these other advanced features of Power Platform, there's also a lot of things they're missing because uh, they weren't meant to be a full InfoPath replacement per se. 
they were meant they were bo uh, both power apps and flow were built kind of separately from sharepoint workflows and infopath forms they were meant to be their own kind of uh, world i i believe it was even a different development group and so then when they came back said, oh by the way we could we need an infopath replacement maybe power apps kind of fits it but not really and there's these limitations it wasn't developed strictly as an infopath replacement in the same way that our nitro studio was that we have in the crow canyon world we built that specifically to build applications powerful applications robust applications forms and workflows on top of the sharepoint and office 365 world so there's a number of limitations uh this is a webinar we had back then we've been doing this infopath replacement and exploring this issue for years and we're talking about power automate in this webinar here's the considerations it's in blue he had, joel had it in orange that's a lot to read a lot to go through i'm not going to go through it because they'll just you eyes will glaze over but basically i was talking about how there's a standalone plan and you pay per user or per flow and then there's one that comes with it and this is the limitation uh this is what you get with your office 365 you have uh you can execute unlimited workflows but with a caveat because you only go up to a certain amount before you run up to your limits pretty generous limit but there is a limit it's unlimited it's like the car wash down the street it says five dollars to wash your car as long as you want as long as it's only 15 minutes you know Wash as long as you want, as long as it's 15 minutes. Unlimited, except for you, know, you only can be there for 15 minutes. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I usually can wash my car in 15 minutes, so it's okay. But still, um, it's kind of a funny sign. And that's kind of what this is right here. Unlimited, except. Uh, and then you get your standard connection, if not your premium. You don't get on-premises gateway. You don't get custom connectors. And you have a daily API limit of 2,000. So it's 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 you know free up to a limit, right? You know that kind of thing. And so don't want to belabor that too much but there is another point that i was going to make on this and i'm going to go over to my other uh, website here uh this is the project manager i'll go into in a minute okay where's the crow canyon browser right here okay here's the crow canyon browser okay so in my latest blogs uh here on crow canyon we've been talking a lot about and if you have a chance to read these if you're into the sharepoint 2010 um replacement here's a lot of information here you know end is near don't panic nitro studio can help you replace it. We also have InfoPath Replacement Manager. So the, the deal here is that there, in this one, I mentioned two specific things that SharePoint Workflow, 2010 workflows have that Power Automate and SharePoint 2013 workflows do not. So if you go to Power Automate, about setting item level permissions, another is about dynamic and circular approvals. So as Joel said, there are third-party tools such as our Nitro Studio that will cover more bases than Power Automate. So we see it as we work in conjunction as, as uh, there's Power Automate, Power App Platform, and there's Nitro Studio. And you, you look at both and say, which one's gonna fit our needs and and provide the uh, the uh, solution that we need here in in uh, to replace these. Because ultimately, like I, like I said earlier, you, you're gonna have to replace these, whether you get an extension or not. I mean, the time is now. And the same thing we harp on all the time about their InfoPath replacement. We've been going on this for two or three years now, and it's funny, people are not reacting. We're getting a lot more reaction this summer, actually, because it is one year from this July to July 2021 when they cut off the mainstream support for InfoPath. And people are starting to say, geez, I better start thinking about this, better do something. You don't just migrate to InfoPath, bada bing, one, one step. You know, it, it isn't an instant thing. It takes a process. As Joel was mentioning about the workflow, it's the same idea. That's why this InfoPath replacement is very similar to SharePoint 2010 workflow replacement or Access Forms or Lotus Notes or any other legacy system. The same idea. You have to know what you have in place and then you go there and uh, set and analyze. Do we need to, re you know, like Joe was saying, do nothing or go to this solution or that solution? How much time and effort is going to take? What is going to go on here? What do we even have in the first place? So we talk about cataloging uh, the uh, current workflows or the current forms. And then this is where our, I'm jumping a little track here, but we have this InfoPath Replacement Manager, which is a project management tool where you can go in and analyze each form or each workflow or each thing that needs to be converted and then get a whole list of what's going on, when it's starting, uh, who's working on it, what is, what are the accessory or ancillary elements of it. Uh, is, does it integrate with some other system? Is there a database connected? You get all the analysis you need in here, and then you can also manage the project of the actual 
progress of it, who's working on it, is it in UAT or user accepted testing, is it in production, is it, so this gives you a lot of uh, uh, insights into what's going on with your, uh, whatever you're converting, in this case, what kind of info path forms, it could just easily be SharePoint 2010 workflows or access forms or notes, whatever, and you get in here and you say, okay, who's working on it, what's, what's, um, what's going on with this project, it gives you a way to manage the project in a very, very, um, useful and uh, uh, organized way and we put this together using a variation of our project manager application in order to uh, help people facilitate their uh, whatever they're replacing whether it's uh, right now we're talking about SharePoint 2010 workflows this thing works for that InfoPath replacement they work for that and these things kind of could go together because a lot of InfoPath forms use 2010 workflows you know? so there's like a whole like a uh, uh, system there together that works on it um, works together on. I'm not able to answer questions while I'm doing this, so there are questions stacking up. We'll try to get to them. And there's all this stuff I'm telling you about Nitro Studio, about InfoPath replacement, about Croquet and his activities. I could go into a long webinar on that, uh, and we're going to have some later this week and next week on Nitro Studio itself. I didn't get a chance to go into that in detail, but let me skim a couple more things, and then we'll jump into some questions. One is that we are doing a massive amount with Teams integration. So our applications and our Nitro Studio on Office 365 is now no longer SharePoint solely. It's Teams integrated. We have self-service bots, staff, ser staff support bots. This is a lot of things, a lot, a lot of interest on this. As people replace legacy systems that were like the old and busted, they're seeing that the hot newness is not only Power Platform, but also extending it beyond the simple concept of forms and workflows into bots, into interactive interfaces, into portals, into ways of doing things that are different than how they were done 10 years ago as the new technology moves very rapidly and the bots are becoming very, very, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot, a lot of interest, in, you know, hot to trot for a bot, we call it. A lot of people are hot to trot for a bot and um, it has a lot of, uh, a lot of power and a lot of capabilities using Microsoft's bot service, Azure bot service, and the AI as a service, AI, AI, IIS, AI as a service, the Azure cognitive services, natural language processing, AI. So we're really moving in a direction that is very, very uh, strong to move beyond uh, simply, move beyond simply uh, moving it from, you know, old and busted here to new and less busted over here to actually new hotness, as Joel, I like his, like his expression, that was good, Joel. The, but the new hotness is cutting edge technology that produces operational efficiency and business automation in your organization through the use of uh, whatever technology is out there. Now the bots are really hot too. And our Nitro workflows also have full integration with Teams. Um, teams in the sense that we can send messages to channels, we can create channels, we can send adaptive cards that have approve and deny. So fully uh, uh, Teams integration, bots integration, that's moving beyond uh, simply replacing the workflows, but making them more powerful and capable and really assessing like how can they work to the best benefit of the organization. Now I had to be real quick at what I'm saying because we're coming right up the top of the hour. Contact Crow Canyon, contact us, sales at crowcanyon.com or me, scott at crowcanyon.com. And we'll be able to help you out, uh, giving you some guidance on this. We have a lot of webinars we've done, uh, a video library full of, um, here's, uh, let's see, Hot to Trot for a Bot, Limits and Costs of Microsoft Platform, Deep Dive into Nitro Studio Workflows, Automated Pro I mean, it goes on and on. We do this literally night and day. And this is what we do, what we live and breathe, is uh, this: uh, how to make the, use the Office 365 and SharePoint platforms to the maximum ability, whether you use Power Platform and we integrate we can work in conjunction with Power Automate and Power App. But then Nitro Studio comes in as a much more powerful and capable solution, extended into teams, extended into bots, that uh, can, uh, and plus we have the expertise on staff to help you move in that direction and be successful. You don't just slap a bot on your, on your, in your team, you gotta build a certain conversational architecture and understand how it integrates with the rest of the, of the, uh, of the uh, workflow process, business process going on at your organization. Okay. I whipped through that really quickly, I know, uh, but we're here you know, to help you out, give you a one-on-one -on -one demo where you can ask questions specifically and say, will this meet our needs? Is this what we need to do to move off the 2010 workflow? As Joel and Ron have been saying, we're here to help you. That's the bottom line. We're here to help. It's our business, we know, but uh, our business is also helping each other um, 
Uh, it's too late for that. It, helping each other, uh, you know, migrate through what Microsoft throws in our track. You know, so they 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 throw it down, and we have to uh, we have to you know adapt to it. Okay, so let's uh, let's move back to Joel, and then end it. And if you want to take some questions, we can. Joel, you okay on that? Yeah, yeah. In fact, I um, I may be a little bit late for my next meeting, but I want to stick here. I I saw that. We've been trying to answer a number of questions privately. I did push out the user voice. It'd be fantastic for anybody who wants to vote to um, to see if we can see if we can get Microsoft to extend the date slightly <laughs> to give us a little bit of breathing room. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, basically, from a proficient perspective, I wanted to let you know that we do have a workflow retirement assessment that we're providing. So if people want. Uh, to just chat about it. We're basically giving some from some free office hours to chat about it. If you want us to look at your your modernization report, we can review it with you. Um, if you actually want us to assess your workflows, um, we have we're basically putting together kind of an assessment um, together to, to be able to dig into that. Um, so there's some some free assessment work that we will do to help um, understand the impact of the of the SharePoint 2010 retirement workflow. Um, that being said, I, I did want to, um, I know that you had one more poll that, uh, that I think would be great to, uh, launch poll number two, um, just to help people understand what, what are you considering? Um, are you planning on um, working with Power Automate? Um, from what you understand about Nitro Studio, are you looking at other third-party solutions? Uh, maybe, maybe um, just just trying to understand where people are at uh, in in their in their plans for for the 2010 workflow retirement. Um, right, right. Yeah, we're going a little over time, but that's fine because this is kind of a critical issue for a lot of people. I mean, you know, even if you get an extension, Absolutely. you still have to start start working on it soon. Absolutely. And uh, people were saying, why is Microsoft doing this in the middle of the COVID thing and all that? Well, there's you know, reasons. I, say, yeah. I think from, from their perspective, and I've heard this, they think that they told everybody a year ago. And I think the challenge is communication is really tough. You know, yeah. if they say it at, said that at Ignite in, in one of the workflow sessions, it's tough to, to have that percolate across the entire community. Like, I, I feel fairly plugged in. I didn't yeah. know that there was going to be this date, like all of a sudden. Like I would have loved to have had a series that led up to this date before all of a sudden it was, oh yeah, we told you a year ago. It's like, uh, where's that article? <laughs> what do you mean you told us a year ago? <laughs> yeah, but my I researched into it and and they basically have to support a whole separate Azure platform to keep the 2010 workflows going. So I think it's a cost or sure. you know, cost I'm effort sure for them. That's the case. I think uh -huh. people just kind of wish that they. It's fine to have a deadline. I think it's more about understanding when those deadlines actually come up. So. Yeah, and it's a little different than InfoPath forms because with SharePoint workflows, they can literally cut them off. With InfoPath forms, well, the forms themselves, they can't stop from running. You know, they, they, they run how they run, I guess, right? But workflows are something that they control up there and up there in the cloud somewhere, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it, it kind of makes sense that I understand this is about processing and, and it's a lot about the, their infrastructure. I'm sure there's a number of things of why they have the roadmap they do. Let, let me let me get a, to a couple of these questions. How will yeah. they turn off workflows for 2013 on-prem? And the answer is no, on-prem is not affected. Yeah, um, they should have put that like front and center. A lot of people have been asking that question and just, don't worry about it. You, if you have your server, your workflows run on the server. Microsoft's not going to come shut, shut them off on your server. I guess they well, could, when, they, when they even say 2013 is deprecated, a lot of people are confused about what that means. Yeah. Essentially, what it means is this is no longer the path. Like, this is no longer in the roadmap. We are moving beyond it. All these workflows essentially have essentially been deprecated. There's no plans for improvement. In fact, there haven't been plans for improvement for a long time in this. I mean, it means they stop development on it completely. Absolutely. They'll continue yeah. to support it, but they won't develop. It's like having an old, I don't know, you know, 2007 Honda or something. I don't know. Yeah. Someone yeah. else is saying, well, what, what does turned off mean? 
Um, so I, I said, like turned off is turned off. They don't work. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So it's like the first thing they do is they block new ones. And then when we're talking November, essentially the turning off means your workflows will not run. And we're talking about the 2010 workflows. And we're talking about November this year, that if you do nothing, you know, you sit, you sit on your hands or whatever, your, your 2010 workflows, and it's different for different tenants, but they will start the process on November 1st of going across all the tenants and essentially call it, call it disable, but they will basically turn off your workflows where they will not run. Um, and I know that sounds impactful, which is the other reason why you, you probably should have a conversation with Microsoft support, uh, including voting on user voice to have them update the date if they can't. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you about the SharePoint modernization scanner. Does that run only on Office 365 or is that something you can run yeah. on premises too? That's only Office 365, right? There's, there's two different ways to run it, but it is designed for, for, um, for the cloud. Okay. You didn't, there, how about the poll, the poll results here too? <laughs> oh yeah, I, I can definitely close the poll. We did have a really good uh, representation there. Um, yeah, I'm I'm uh, just looking at the uh, that, that one slide, and I, I kind of had the, the questions in front of me, so I couldn't tell. All right, um, and we we can definitely wrap this up. Um, if there's anything you wanted to say and kind of wrap up um, before we shut this down. Well, I think a big thank you to you and Joel. I mean, you and uh, Ron for for you know uh, call you know getting together with Crow Canyon and put this together because it's one of these things that require uh, community to do something, and we're we're here to help out. We're here to we have tools, we have expertise, we have guidance, you know, and people don't have to feel like they're just thrown off you know deep end of the pool or pushed off the bus or something, whatever whatever you want right. to say. Right, and, and I, I I absolutely agree. I think that. It, it's it's better to have a discussion about this stuff, you know. With COVID, I'm sure that's probably what much be before this. It would have been much more of a conversation at Inspire. Hey, partners, we're going to announce this thing at Ignite, um, where we're going to let all people know. Like posting it in a blog, it, it took a lot of us off guard. So being able to turn this into a discussion with the community, you know, it's it's your ability to corner somebody at an event and say. What's the deal? You know, with COVID, it makes it a little bit more difficult to say, hey, Chris McNulty, what's going on? Why are you saying this? Why do we have such a short time frame? When you can't see them and you can't reach out and touch them, it's much more difficult to kind of read in a blog that says, hey, contact us. It's like, oh man, if, you know, if we, we could actually sit you down and tell you about the impact to, you know the business critical nature of what's happening here that's what microsoft's looking for they they really want to hear from the customers what kind of impact this will have and uh how how we'll be able to to, to loop that together so i appreciate everybody who, who's on here who understands the sense of urgency and as well um you know we're we're in this all together um and uh, we're we're happy to help push push with Microsoft as well. Uh, we spend a lot of time with those guys. Yeah, I used to see Chris at all the shows. I'm sure you did too. And yeah, you know, remember we used to travel, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> I remember those days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Joel and I went to Ensenada last fall. It was a lot of fun for a SharePoint Saturday. Anyway, oh, yeah. yeah, it was great. So thanks, thanks again, everybody, for joining the webinar. Our decks will absolutely be posted. This, I expect this is the recording will be available as well on Crow Canyon site. I'm sure anybody who registered will get a link through the email. Yes. Yeah, so don't don't worry about uh, the information that was shared. You, you absolutely will have access to this. Sure, and they can contact uh, you. You have your email address and uh, me. You know, either way, directly, and we'll be able, you know, continue the conversation, answer questions. Yeah. And Help out in any way we can. You want to reach out to me so that you can float to the top of the list. Um, uh, but I will try and follow up with those on the on the poll as well. Okay, sounds good, Jones. Yep. Awesome. Thank Thanks you. again. Thanks again. Okay, everyone, have a good day, and we'll be in touch. Okay. Bye. Talk soon. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.